Last summer, all but one of the Confederate memorials lining Richmond's Monument Avenue were finally removed. Let me be clear from the start. I want all Confederate memorials removed from public space as they, where they indicate support for armed insurrection against the government of the United States and for slavery, which of course was the cause, the reason for that, that particular insurrection was fought. But I also believe that it is important to understand how they got to be where they are, including what specific form they took and what the origins of those forms were. At the same time, I do not want to suggest that any particular form has inherent political content. All of this matters as we move forward to design more inclusive monuments. There is one Confederate monument that cannot easily be taken down because it is carved into the live rock of Stone Mountain in Georgia. To this historian of German memory, there is something eerily familiar about it. The irony is that the experience of designing what remains the largest memorial to the soldiers and sailors who fought for the Union ultimately inspired the creation of the largest as well as possibly most indestructible of all Confederate monuments. The lesson of how fleeting the meaning attached to architectural form and style can be should not be lost upon those challenged with designing monuments that fit the commemorative agendas of our own time. Let me begin in Berlin, a city that has for decades been at the center of analyses of memory in relation to architecture. Discussions of German memory typically focus upon the Holocaust and the other atrocities unleashed by the Third Reich. These have produced a very different approach to commemoration, which you see epitomized in Peter Eisenman's uh, Memorial to the Murdered Jews of Europe at the bottom of your screen than that adopted by those Americans who sought to celebrate white supremacy. In the German case, the focus has been upon what James E. Young termed counter monuments, whereas Confederate mem memorials are usually figural, uh, focusing on either the anonymous private or leading, uh, as so many courthouse lawns do, or leading generals such as Robert E. Lee, Thomas Stonewell Jackson, and Jeb Stewart. And although less often, Confederate President Jefferson Davis. Scholars of German memory, moreover, have to confront the prominent presence of buildings erected by discredited regimes. While Nazi insignia were quickly stripped from public space after World War II, many of the signature buildings erected by Hitler's dictatorship continue in use today, including as the foreign and finance ministries of the Federal Republic and the air ministry built by Goering is now the finance ministry uh, in uh, the building I show at the top uh, right there. More recently, following the reunification of Germany in 1990, the East German foreign ministry and the palace of the Republic in the heart of Berlin were both demolished. The two other communist era show pieces just to the east of them, Alexander Platz at the top of your screen and Karl Marx Allee, originally Stalin Allee at the bottom, largely retain their East German appearance. And you can see Alexander Platz in the background of the slide of the photograph of Karl Marx Allee. The shorter lived Confederacy did not leave behind a legacy of purpose built structures. So discussion of Confederate memory instead focus, discussions of Confederate memory instead focus on statuary erected long after Lee's surrender at Appomattox. While obviously Nazi statuary was quickly removed from German public space, large images of Karl Marx, most created well after the general diminishment of socialist realism in East German public life, continue to dot cityscapes in the former East Germany. These, however, as we shall see this evening, are scarcely the biggest public sculptures on view in Germany today. Communism had no monopoly there on oversized commemorative statuary. The few analyses that pair an assessment of German and American Civil War memory have focused on the Third Reich and the Confederacy. Missing from these discussions, however, have been the links that tie American celebration of the Union's victory, as epitomized by the Indiana Soldier and Sailors Monument on the far left of your screen, 
uh, two uh, structures erected in the 1890s to commemorate Wilhelm I, as well as the impact that turn of the century German memorial culture, epitomized by the Battle of the Nations monument in the middle of your screen, had upon American architecture and sculpture. Tracing the arc of the career of Bruno Schmitz, the architect of what remains the largest memorial to the Union through the colossal monuments he built in Germany and as, a, addressing their influence upon Frank Lloyd Wright through Eliel Saarinen to Bertram Goodhue as in the Nebraska State Capitol at Wright and upon Goodson Borglum reminds us that winners as well as losers shaped memorial culture. Finally, at a time when commemoration once again focuses on the centrality of the human figure Inserting Schmitz back into the conversation reminds us of the middle ground he created between the equestrian monuments that line Monument Avenue and the counter monuments that have dominated discussion of Holocaust commemoration. Except for statues of single soldiers, many of which are almost indistinguishable from their Union counterparts, monuments to the Confederacy began to be built in large numbers only in the 1890s when the Jim Crow pushback against reconstruction was already well advanced. Baltimore's statue of Lee and Jackson was dedicated as late as 1948 in the presence of the city's democratic mayor, Thomas D'Alessandro, Nancy Pelosi's father. The spate of equestrian statues to Confederate generals that began with the dedication of the Lee Memorial on Richmond's Monument Avenue were also a response to the Indiana Soldier and Sailors Monument in Indianapolis. Although dedicated only in 1902, it was the result of a competition held in 1888. The groundbreaking overseen by Pre President Benjamin Harrison was national news. The memorial to the state's dead in conflicts from the American Revolution through the Spanish-American War, which hadn't even been fought uh, when the groundbreaking occurred, continues to be one of Indiana's iconic structures. Writing in 1954, more than half a century after its completion, Eve Draggart proudly described it as, quote, perhaps the crowning achievement of this golden age of Indianapolis culture. An obelisk on a tall base bedecked and topped with allegorical sculpture representing among other things, infantry, cavalry, artillery, navy, and at the top victory. It also features an observatory that can be accessed by either stairs or an elevator. Towering more than 284 feet, this was the first Civil War memorial to participate in the contemporary American vogue for the colossal. Other products of this included the Washington Monument, completed in 1884, which at a height of 555 feet was then the tallest structure in the world, and the Statue of Liberty, which stretched 305 feet from base to top torch. An entry by the young German architect Bruno Schmitz triumphed in the competition to design the Indianapolis Monument. Schmitz was known above all at the time for having won first prize in the contest for the Vittore Emanuele Monument in Rome, although in the end, another, the work of another competitor was built. On his subsequent travels to the United States following his victory in the competition, Schmitz must have found himself particularly at home in Indianapolis. Many Hughesier artists, including the renowned painter William Merritt Chase, had studied in Munich. Schmitz may have entered the competition after a leading local businessman who had immigrated to Indianapolis from Dusseldorf brought the competition to the attention of his brother back home, where Schmitz must have already been the talk of his hometown after his Italian victory. The size, modernity, and politics surrounding the Indianapolis Monument distinguished it from the statues that would soon go up in Richmond. The festivities associated with the Cornerstone Lane in 1889 included electric lighting, then still a novelty. In comparison, the much smaller equestrian bronzes on Monument Avenue conform to a type that can be traced back to a depiction of the Roman Emperor Marcus Aurelius. Uh, this would, typology was revived in the Renaissance, while the Jefferson Davis Memorial uh, unveiled in 1907 was only about a third the height of the Soldiers and Sailors Monument. A much taller obelisk commemorating Davis would later be erected in Fairview, Kentucky. The politics surrounding Schmitz's monument was also very different in tone from that expressed 
Southeast in Richmond. While the statues that provide, presided over Monument Avenue celebrated the achievements of individual men, the Soldiers and Sailors Monument commemorated all who had served. President Harrison claimed credit for this concept when he presided over the laying of the cornerstone. He had served as a brigadier general in the Civil War before being elected governor of Indiana. He was a native of Ohio, although his grandfather, President William Henry Harrison, had been born into a slaveholding family in Virginia. In it, Harrison's address to the assembled crowd estimated at um, 40,000 people, the president made clear his opposition to the emerging myth of the lost cause. He declared of the monument, no American citizen need avoid it or pass it with an unsympathetic eye, for it does not commemorate a war of subjugation. There is not in the United States today a man who, if he realizes what has occurred since the war and has opened his soul to the sight of that which is to come, will not feel that it is good for all our people that victory crowned the cause which this monument commemorates. I do seriously believe that if we can measure among the states the benefits resulting from the preservation of the union, then the rebellious states have the largest share. It destroyed an institution that was their destruction. That's really important because when I was in school in the 1960s, just below the Mason-Dixon line, we were taught that the war was not fought over slavery, but states' rights. But in 1889, President Harrison is very clear about this. Schmitz's victory in Indianapolis and his trips to the United States on several occasions between 1888 and 1893 transformed his approach to architecture. His American experience encouraged him to work on a scale that German commemorative culture had previously achieved only in freestanding buildings, such as the Valhalla at the bottom of your screen and the Liberation Hall at the top, designed respectively by Leo von Klenze and Friedrich von Gertner and erected outside of Regensburg by King Ludwig I of Bavaria. Moreover, having been exposed in the United States to the work of Henry Hobson Richardson, Schmitz returned to Germany ready to pioneer a starkly modern alternative to the neoclassicism on display outside of Regensburg. Richardson, a native of Louisiana, sat out the Civil War while studying architecture at the École de Beaux-Arts in Paris. A Harvard graduate, he regularly crossed the English Channel during the conflict to visit his former classmate, Henry Adams, who served in London as secretary to his father, the American ambassador, Charles Francis Adams, the son and great grandson, of, well, let's note the son and grandson of presidents, John Adams and John Quincy Adams. Richardson's victory with the Romanesque revival design in the competition for Trinity Church on Boston's Copley Square launched his career as the most imaginative American architect of his day. In the last years before his premature death, Richardson, through his use of geological metaphors, invented an architecture of permanence for a country whose white intelligentsia were, at a time of enormous change, insecure about what they saw as its relatively shallow past. This permanence, I should note, proved elusive, as many of Richardson's buildings were demolished already before World War II. As James O'Gorman has noted, and I quote, in the Rockies, Yosemite and Yellowstone were natural forms to rival the man-made landmarks of Europe. One manifestation of this idea is the constant repetition of variations on this theme found in scientific as well as popular literature that American landforms were substitute for European monuments, end quote. In commissions such as the Ames Monument to a builder of the Transcontinental Railroad completed in 1882, and the modest gate lodge Richardson built for the St. Family's Northeastern Massachusetts estate finished the previous year. Quotations of medieval architecture were increasingly replaced by the use of rusticated stone and even loose boulders in a way that implied that the buildings themselves were natural formations. Whether or not Schmidt saw either of these structures for himself, he was certainly aware of them as they were widely published. And Admiration for the Romanesque had been widespread in 19th century Germany, and American historians of architecture have almost certainly correctly discerned German influences upon Richardson's adoption of the style. 
During the 1890s, it's used by German nationalists as in the Kaiser Wilhelm Memorial Church at, at left, stemmed in part from the fact that it had been the style when the Holy Roman Emperors ruled from the territory of what became Germany in 1871, rather than from Vienna and Prague, cities that belonged in the 1880s and 90s to the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Schmitz did not need Richardson's example to master an indigenous German style. And the Cathedral at Worms is a good example of uh, German Romanesque. Instead, what he learned from the American was how to imply that architecture had emerged out of the earth almost as live rock. This geological metaphor anchored Richardson's buildings in their sites. In Germany, Schmitz would write a new chapter in the history of memorial architecture and sculpture based on the forms that were popular in the United States, but he would put them to new specifically German political uses. Just as Richardson had invented them to imply that a new nation on land seized, in the case of Wyoming quite recently from its original inhabitants, was natural and permanent, Schmitz would use it to anchor the rulers of an even more recently formed country into its landscape. In the wake of his Indianapolis commission, Schmitz successfully competed between 1889 and 1890 for three of the largest and most prestigious monuments ever erected in Germany. A fourth finished only in 1913 eventually followed. The first three celebrate Emperor Wilhelm I, who had, died, uh, had just died, and who had presided over the unification of Germany in 1871. These are located in Koblenz, uh, which you'll see in a moment, Port of Asphalica on the left and Kiffhäuser on the uh, right. The fourth, the Battle of the Nations Monument stands in the suburbs of Leipzig. All four sit somewhat uncomfortably between the historicism of much 19th century German architecture and the clear break with history created by Art Nouveau and subsequent early 20th century reformers such as Peter Behrens. The over Bert nationalism of Schmitz's four monuments foreshadows the scale and scenography of Nazi spectacles, although they are distinctly different in both form and political orientation. Schmitz's structures are distinguished by three features that do not figure prominently in Indianapolis. The first is the use throughout of rusticated stone that makes his work appear to emerge organically out of the site, which is either located in nature or if in a city, well away from other buildings. This he clearly got from Richardson. The second is the scale of the freestanding sculptures of Wilhelm I. Uh, one of them is um, tucked under the baldachin at Porta Fasfalica, and the other one is that green uh, bronze uh, standing out in the middle of the Kiffhauser monument. Here the impact upon him of the Statue of Liberty, which we would have seen as he sailed into New York Harbor is clear. The third are the bas-relief sculptures that although executed by others are integral to the architecture out of which they also appear to grow organically. The least Richardsonian of the four is the monument to Wilhelm in Koblenz. Schmidt sub submitted his first design in 1889, his second in 1893. The structure somewhat revised to suit Wilhelm's grandson, the reigning emperor Wilhelm II, was completed in 1897. Only in the rusticated stone plinth supporting the enormous equestrian uh, statue does the monument at the confluence known as the German corner of the Rhine and Mosul rivers possibly reflect his awareness of Richardson. But the scale of the figure and indeed many details of the base are undoubtedly indebted to Friedrich, uh, Frederic, I should say in the French, Auguste Bartholdi's enormous figure of liberty. The base of the plinth features an eagle. It's hard to see it there, but at, at the base it's there, believe me, in bas relief, with elongated outstretched wings by Auguste Vogel that introduced the relief carving that would be a prominent feature in two of Schmitz's later memorials. The fusion of architecture and sculpture here itself harked back to what were then the relatively recently excavated ancient Near Eastern site of Ashenet. I never say this right. Asher Nasser Paul's the second's palace at Nimrud in what is now Iraq. Uncovered beginning in 1845, much of this material was 
this time already divided between museums in Asia, Europe, and North America. Some of you may know this material from the Met in New York, but Schmitz would have seen it in Berlin where he was then living. And I show you an example uh, on display in a later museum in Berlin, but something Schmitz could have seen for himself. This was for his later American audience, the most novel feature of Schmitz's monuments from which they would arguably learn the most. Schmitz's original proposal for Koblenz was clearly based on the shape of his Indiana Memorial, which is better preserved in the realized version of the second of his 1889 competition victories, the Kiffhäuser Monument. Even more than its Koblenz ca counterpart, this was carefully slotted into its site. The three shallow arches repeated on each of the three sides of the forecourt imply as well that the structure remains half buried in the way that an excavated archeological site might be. The statue of Wilhelm I was yet another large bronze equestrian work. The frontal view is however dominated by the figure of Holy Roman Emperor Friedrich I, also known as Barbarossa or Redbeard, which is in keeping with the reddish tinge of the local rock. The medieval emperor carved here by Nicholas Geiger was also, who, who also worked on the soldier and sailors monument, sports a, flowering, a flowing beard and sits on a bench in front of a Romanesque arch directly below Wilhelm. According to legend, Barbarossa, who expanded and frequented a castle on the site, lay asleep in a cave here. Oops, I went forward too quickly, excuse me. From which he would eventually awake and restore Germany to its greatness. Something Wilhelm is here depicted as having achieved. Actually, of course, you really only see the horse in this view and not Wilhelm himself, but I assure you he's atop it. The bonding of Barbarossa to the stone of the mountain is thus significant from an iconographical as well as aesthetic perspective. The podium for the rusticated baldachin Schmitz designed in 1890 to hold the colossal sculpture of Wilhelm or installed at Porta Westphalica six years later. It's cut into the landscape just below the crest of the hill. This design forms a bridge between the Kiffhäuser and Battle of the Nations monuments. The hill is named for Wiedekind, uh, who in the eighth century led the Saxons in battle against Charlemagne. In other words, an, an anticipation of Wilhelm I's uh, victory, uh, not that he leads anybody in battle himself, against the French in 1870 in the Franco-Prussian War. But it is the Battle of the Nations monument that represents the acme of Schmitz's achievement and which undoubtedly accounts for much of his influence upon American architecture and sculpture. Commemorating the 1813 victory of Prussia and its allies over Napoleon and the local Saxons rather than Wilhelm, this was the largest of Schmitz's monuments with a footprint that included a reflecting pool. At a height of nearly 300 feet, it remains the tallest of all European memorials. It was also the most resolutely modern in the use Schmitz made of reinforced concrete, although this was largely hidden from view by the usual rusticated stone cladding. Lacking the hilltop sites on which the Kiffhauser and Porta Westphalica monuments had been built, Schmitz here created an artificial mound into which he appeared to sink the forecourt. I, it, well, into which he appeared to sink the monument, really, not just the forecourt. And I first became interested in Schmitz because Eric Mendelssohn followed this um, precedent uh, very carefully, closely when he designed uh, the Einstein Tower in Potsdam after World War I. Schmitz ringed the entire complex, including the large forecourt with a hillock capped with trees. The apparent integration with nature is thus intensified here, although the landscape is entirely man-made. In Leipzig, the sculptors Christian Behrens uh, in the uh, crypt and the interior of the building and his successor Franz Metzner, uh, who's uh, Archangel Michael, uh, Michael, Michael you see on the exterior, developed a style that supported not only the monument's nationalist message, but also the idea that it was a primeval projection out of the earth, anchored not only in a particular place, but in ancient Mesopotamian art and architecture. These associations, particularly with Assyria, established as well by the vaguely ziggurat form of the monument, um, are important because they, um, 
they stretch further back in time than the classical sources on view and, and uh, Regensburg. And I won't claim to you that the Baron's statues really are um, Mesopotamian, but they have this archaic um, attitude, uh, archaic Greek maybe rather than classical Greek. There is supposed to be something uh, primitive about this forcefulness here, uh, not in the ways in which uh, Picasso was looking at African masks at this time, but to get back to the essence of the primeval of the original culture, uh, Ur uh, in German means origin, and it was uh, the name that was given as well uh, to one of the cities in ancient Mesopotamia uh, by German archeologists, I believe. I may be wrong about that. Schmitz's four monuments were seen at the time as contributing to national integration. Koblenz was where the Treaty of Verdun, dividing Charlemagne's empire into thirds had been drawn up. The German corner had been the site as well of a 13th century stronghold of the Teutonic Knights. The memorial in Porta Westphalica signaled the integration of largely Catholic Westphalia back into the Prussian Protestant patriot, uh, patriotic fold after the Kultur camp of the 1870s, uh, where the uh, uh, new German government had tried to uh, uh, tamp down on Catholicism. Moreover, the fusion of myth, monument, and art present at these sites provided a stage set for the emergence of new forms of nationalism, rooted not only in the experience of particular landscapes, but in the emotions fostered by the way in which structure, uh, Schmitz's structures framed them. This was something that would appeal not only to those responsible for Confederate monument, the Confederate Memorial at Stone Mountain, but also to American architects. Although they continue to be popular tourist sites, Schmitz's monuments have been almost entirely overlooked in the English language literature on German architecture. At the time they were built, however, they were among the most celebrated new structures in the country. They were widely known as well to those Americans interested in modern art and architecture who traveled to Europe in the last years before World War I. At least three major figures, Wright, Goodhue, and Borglum, infused their designs for buildings and sculptures in the United States with lessons absorbed directly or indirectly from them. The range of these works and of their political associations reveals, however, that just as Schmitz put Richardson's geologically infused Romanesque to new uses, so too could those who borrowed from him and his collaborators use what they had learned to serve diverse purposes. Although their politics varied, in all cases, the intent was in part to naturalize white inhabitation of land that people of European descent had begun to occupy in large numbers only in the 19th century, as well as in the case of Stone Mountain, to ensure that memory of the Confederacy could not be easily erased. In 1909, Frank Lloyd Wright traveled to Europe. While there, he famously arranged for the publication of his works by the Berlin publisher Vosmuth. The Vosmuth portfolio had a transformative impact upon ambitious young German architects, including Walter Gropius, Erich Mendelssohn, and Ludwig Mies van der Rohe. Influence traveled in two directions, however. In 1910, Wright met Metzner when he was in the process of sculpting his contributions to the Battle of the Nations Monuments. Uh, Anthony Olofsson has already documented the impact of Metzner's work upon Wright's architectural sculpture. The possible influence of Schmitz's deft sighting of the Battle of the Nations Monument uh, on Taliesin has been overlooked, I think. Taliesin, the house Wright built for himself in 1911, represented a bold new chapter in his integration of architecture and landscape. And I show you the views of the 1911 Taliesin before the notorious fire. Many of the strategies had, he adopted here have precedence in Richardson's work, but Wright had not previously used rusticated stone in this way, while the cutting of the building into the landscape is more sophisticated than anything Richardson had done, but very much in the spirit of Schmitz. Here, the implication that the house had grown organically out of the hillside naturalized the fact, uh, naturalized Wright's adulterous relationship with his partner, Mama Borthwick, and his family's ownership of land that is as recently as the 1830s been occupied by Native Americans. Nor was this the only context in which Schmitz's influence could be seen in the United States. 
Upon his death in 1924, Bertram Groves near Goodhue was widely hailed as having been the country's greatest living architect, a stature Wright was accorded only a decade later. Although Goodhue remains best known for his Gothic revival churches and his creation of what was seen as an appropriately Hispanic style for buildings in California and Hawaii, why Spanish should be appropriate for Hawaii is another matter, Goodhue's final buildings completed posthumously include two structures, the Nebraska State Capitol and the Los Angeles Public Library that clearly reference schemes by the Finnish architect, Alil Saarinen, who had moved to the United States himself in 1923. In turn, Saarinen's interest in ziggurat-like massing and in buildings out of which human figures appear to grow can be traced back to the Battle of the Nations monument. Equally important are the sculptures by Lee Lowry, best known for his statue of Atlas at Rockefeller Center in New York on the building in Lincoln. These integrate human figures into the architecture in a way that suggests an awareness of Metzner's work uh, and certainly is based upon what Saarinen uh, had done already at the Helsinki train station and proposed in the Finnish parliament scheme I just showed you. And it all, these, uh, this also foreshadows what Borglum would soon attempt at Stone Mountain. In Nebraska, however, where one panel that I show at the top right illustrates Lincoln reading the Emancipation Proclamation, the pro politics is resolutely unionist. If also, despite a nodding respect for Nebraska's first peoples and their beliefs, profoundly exclusionary. Nebraska had, first, had been settled by people of European and African descent in the 1850s, even more recently than Wisconsin. One text here reads, and you may be able to see it on the side of the uh, plinth holding the buffalo, honor to pioneers who broke the sod that men to come might live here. The second names the peoples whom the pi so-called pioneers displaced above a bison whose body bears the Navajo text, in beauty I walk, with beauty before me I walk, with beauty behind me I walk, with beauty above me I walk. And particularly the style of in which the bison is carved is very, very close to the statues at Nimrod. By the time Lowry began his work on the Nebraska State Capitol, the Confederate monument to Stone uh, on Stone Mountain was underway. Only in 1821 was control of this part of Georgia wrenched away from its original inhabitants. Plans to place statues of Confederate figures on the face of the mountain were first voiced in 1914. Although Borglum only actually carved ahead of Robert E. Lee, which was eventually uh, uh, erased in order to, for the current scheme to be there, he could nonetheless be credited with envisioning the scale of what was only completed in 1970. Although the final result was shorn of the reflecting pool, probably inspired by the battle, <coughs> excuse me, at the nation's monument. Borglum, who joined the Ku Klux Klan in an attempt to keep the Stone Mountain Commission, went on to conceive of the colossal presidential heads at Mount Rushmore in South Dakota, completed after his death under the leadership of his son. Although the style of carving on Stone Mountain owed much less to Nimrod or Metzner than was the case in Lincoln, the scale of ambition and the integration of historical figures with live rock were almost certainly stimulated by an awareness of Schmitz. Borglum was in Paris from 1890 to 93, when all but the Battle of the Nations monuments were being realized, and in London from 1896 to 1901. It is also likely that some of his Georgia patrons had seen Schmitz's work on trips to Germany or aware of it, them through reading travel literature. A contemporary journalist quoted Borglum as saying that the monument, which he intended to feature an army of cavalry, artillery, and infantry was, and I quote, the first effort in this country to build a memorial to a cause without singling out an individual, end quote. Something we have seen that Harrison intended already at the Soldier and Sailors Monument three decades earlier. There was no question that Borglum intended this to be a modern memorial, both in terms of its size and content. As completed by Henry Augustus Lukeman and others, the figures of Jefferson Davis, Lee, and Jackson on horseback striding across the face of the mountain comprised the largest memorial to the Confederacy. It was uh, conceived and finished in the context of local outpourings of racist hate. In 1915, Caroline 
Helen Jemison Plain, the honorary life president of the Georgia Division of the United Daughters of the Confederacy, approached Borglum to ask whether he would, despite not being from the South, be interested in carving the proposed memorial. The same year saw the refounding, shortly after the lynching of Leo Frank in nearby Marietta, the refounding atop the mountain of the Ku Klux Klan, which would continue to rally annually at the site for years to come. After the state of Georgia acquired the land, the resulting state park was open to the public. This seems unbelievable in my own lifetime. In 1965, on the centennial of Abraham Lincoln's assassination, which was basically being celebrated by the opening of a park with a Confederate memorial. The memorial itself was finally dedicated, and this may seem equally surprising to some of you, in 1970 in the presence of Georgia Governor Jimmy Carter and Vice President Spiro Agnew. As Grace Elizabeth Hale has noted, and I quote, the halting progress of the carving of Stone Mountain into a memorial provided a paradoxical measure of white regional insecurity, nationalism, and ambition. Thus, the story of Schmitz's role in American memorial culture originally triggered when he won the competition for an outsized monument to the defenders of the Union, concluded nearly a century later with an even larger Confederate memorial, almost certainly inconceivable without the example of the nationalist monuments he erected back in Germany using lessons drawn from his American experience. Of course, Schmitz bears none of the blame for this, and other more democratically architects made, as we have seen, less offensive use of the paradigm he established. But these examples should cause us to think twice about what architects and their clients are doing when they attempt to create a strong sense of place that denies other people's claim to territory and to rights. The civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s focused above all on changing laws that made Jim Crow segregation possible. The presence of monuments to the Confederacy undoubtedly troubled many of those involved in, these campaign, in the campaign for justice, but for the most part, they focused their ambition elsewhere. At the time, the notion of military heroes on horseback seemed outdated, aside from the Marine Corps War Memorial depicting the raising of the American flag over Iwo Jima, almost no commemorative statuary was erected in the United States to mark its victory in World War II. Maya Lin's design for the Vietnam War Memorial dedicated in Washington in 1893 offered a compelling if originally controversial alternative to figural sculpture one whose effectiveness was further reinforced by monuments to the Holocaust erected on both sides of the Atlantic. In this context, the addition in, 18, in 1996 of a statue to Arthur Ashe on Richmond's Monument Avenue could, along with other representational commemorative statues such as Boston's Irish Famine Memorial, be understood as aesthetically, if by no means politically, retrograde. Only with the comp completion of the widely lauded National Memorial for Peace and Justice, which I show you in the bottom, did figural sculpture begin to reappear, albeit in the context of a powerfully abstract overall design, clearly inspired by recent commemorations of the Holocaust. Opened in 2018 in Montgomery, Alabama, the National Memorial for Peace and Justice is largely uh, devoted to remembering lynching, but the statue you see in the foreground commemorates slavery. Um, it includes the literal display of soil extracted from the sites where such atrocities happened. And that also emphasizes the particularity of place. Since Dylan Ruff opened fire at Emanuel African American Methodist Church in Charleston in 2015, the focus of the discussion, as the lynching memorial begins to illustrate, has shifted from laws to bodies. The 2017 protests by white supremacists in Charlottesville, triggered by attempts to remove its Confederate monuments, and the new round of Black Lives Matters protests prompted by the murder of George Floyd last summer, have kept attention focused upon those, the bodies of Blacks killed by the police and by other racist whites. But they have also encompassed the bronze figures of the Confederates, including both generals on horseback and the humbler privates at dot courthouse lawns. The presence of those long dead as well as recently killed 
turned out to still matter enormously. For many, the most powerful aspect of the repurposing of the Frederick, of the, excuse me, Robert E. Lee statue in Richmond in the summer of 2020 were Dustin Klein's projections upon it of black bodies. These included Harriet Tubman and Frederick Douglass, whose calls for emancipation Lee fought to stymie, as well, of course, here as Breonna Taylor. Returning the focus to bodies defines the struggle as being over who belongs and deserves to be safe in public space. After decades of legal reforms have failed to protect black lives, removing the bodies whose continued presence communicates that ra racism is respectable and thus emboldens racist killings now appears to be more than simply symbolic. Thank you. <laughs>